right, hello everyone. My name is Bianca Brooks, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Ola Yinka. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Wonderful. So what does Ola Yinka mean? Ola Yinka means wealth surrounds me. That is a very good name. <laughs> <laughs> that is a yes, very good yes, name. Yes. And you are from Nigeria? Yes, Nigerian, yes. So were you born and raised in Nigeria or born and raised here and then you went to visit Nigeria? I was born and raised in Nigeria. I came here around when I was 13 years old. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, how do you like it here? Uh, it's nice. It's nice. I, I love, uh, I like it. I, I met a lot of friends, different people, different uh, cultures. and um, But, you know, home is always home. So I was do my best to go home. So. I know the feeling. I'm from yeah. Haiti, so yeah. <laughs> my family members who come here, they actually don't like it because it's cold. Yeah, it's cold. Yeah, it's cold. Cold time. If I had a choice, I would be in Nigeria and come here during the summertime on vacation. So, yeah. So that's <laughs> the right idea. That's what my family members do. Do, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah they only yeah. come when it's summer, and during Someone's the winter, they just disappear. Exactly, exactly. All right, wonderful. So, you speak Yoruba, right? Yoruba, yes. Yes, and the Yoruba, they have a spiritual following or religion or yeah Yoruba people we're actually a nation um like Jamaicans and Asians uh so but Yoruba is also a spiritual spirituality so um like I said I I tend to stay away from the term religion when it comes to Yoruba um because spirituality is more um it's not so organized I would speak I would say so I religion I say Christian and Muslim would be more of an organized um form of spirituality but Yoruba itself is really not it's more of a path um, of a path a spiritual path for individuals like it's different for different people so it's more of a spiritual path for you know, different people based on where you are okay yeah. so how do you feel more in depth when it comes to Christianity um I feel as an individual um, I feel Christianity does not really reflect me um, does not really um, has not really done anything progressive for me as a person, and as a, also as a collective, as African people. And again, you know, uh, when I say African people, I do mean um, African people, you know, all over the world in America, Africans in America, African in Haiti, African in Jamaica, and African throughout. So it hasn't really done anything progressive. As a matter of fact, it has actually set us back um, as a race. Um, you know, if you look at anywhere in the world where there's Christianity, per se, for African people, we're, um, we're actually the, still the most oppressed. Um, and all these churches, what I've done is they've actually kept, up, kept us in a place of, in a state of delusions um, as a people. Okay. Yeah. Well, how do you feel? Because some people actually take Christianity very seriously. I don't right. know if you've ever had anybody knock on your door like a Jehovah Witness and they try to spread to you the good news. Like, have you ever had that happen to you? Yeah, all the, all, the, all the time. I have friends who are, <laughs> who oh, are did passionate. Did they try to save you? No, no. I think they, they gave up years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So now when it comes to, I know that you have a, is it a lunch program that you have? Yes, yes. Thanks for bringing that up, actually. So I have a lunch program in uh, Nigeria. It's a meal program, so to speak. So our plan is to go to the schools. It's, 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 um, schools for mostly, you know, poor kids, you know, poor people, they bring the, the kids for um, education, give them, they don't really get um, adequate meals. Um, and I think that's one of the first places that we should start, actually, you know, to give them a good breakfast, lunch, and um, snacks to go home. Um, I've seen, so they could focus more on their studies. So one of the future programs I'm also going to be doing is bringing more Afrocentric programs into the school system. So a lot of people will go into Africa and think, you know, let's build our schools, let's build schools, and which is something which is great. So you own schools in Africa? No, I do not. But, <laughs> I mean, this is just an idea of mine, just to kind of go into the schools that are already there and kind of bring in Afrocentric programs, bring in meal programs, because um, they have systems there already. So I just Job is makes to come and try to change things um, with everything that I have there, and maybe in the future, you know, I, I will build a school. But right, right now, focus well, on the That would be program. exciting. We would love to hear about. Yes, that. yes, yes. Thank you. All right. So I know that in Nigeria, um, currently, girls are fighting so that they can wear their hair naturally to school. Right. How do you feel about that? The fact that women who wear their hair in their natural state, it's considered to be a political statement. Um. Going, going to back what I said about Christianity, um, it has to reflect us. You know, when it's a problem for you to walk around in your own natural state, when it's a problem for you 
to be yourself, to have a problem with the air that grows out of your head, you know, to see it as um, dirty, as impure, as unorganized, whatever, something negative. It's a problem. It says a lot about issues as African people. Um, even in Nigeria, we're not even, in some schools, they're not allowed to speak their language. So meaning some schools in Nigeria, meaning if you speak Yoruba, you get punished for speaking Yoruba. You have to speak English. Um, and I've said this many times, in Yoruba, there is no negative word for black unless you speak it in the context of English. Black is a good thing in Yoruba, in Yoruba, because it's who we are. It's a reflection of who we are. Now, if you go to English, if you look up the word black, it's all negative because it takes us away from who we are. Um, and then we become a conduit of somebody else's perspective, somebody else's uh, ideologies, um, and, and it shows in our behavior towards ourselves um, and how we, we act towards other people. So again, if you notice, even in Africa, we're more embracive of other groups than we are of, um, of ourselves as, um, as African people. Um, even a lot of Caribbean people Jamaicans, Asians, or even Latin America don't want to accept that they're African. They try to get, stay away from that. So it kind of, it's all tied together. Um, the fact that we just don't want, we don't love our own reflection. Um, and it has to change at some point, you know, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you said that we're so welcoming of other groups. Right. I have been reading a lot of articles online right. that are saying that the Chinese are settling in Africa right. and they're buying land and right. that the officers are learning to speak Chinese. Right. Is this true? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Chinese is definitely taking over Africa aggressively. You know, I use the word aggressively. <laughs> the government isn't doing anything? Uh, it is not. Again, the government is... Uh, the ones give them contracts, of course. Um, and this is not just in Africa. If you look at Caribbean, if you look at Jamaica, Jamaica is about to be the colony, the first colony of, of, China, of China. You know, they basically take over. And I told, my, I told a friend of mine who was also Jamaica, I said, if Africans from Africa went to Jamaica and were buying a plant, building a bridges, doing all this institutional, building institutions like the Chinese were doing, do you think the Jamaican people will just stay there and just be passive about it or not be as aggressive about it as they would not. There will be a revolution overnight. Why? Because, again, going back to what I said, we are more, we tend to be more submissive when it comes to other groups and other ideologies, other perspective than when it comes to our people. Again, and if we have this mentality of just beating up ourselves, you know, and just, you know, again, we know we have issues with the government in, in any country, any country where there's a black population, there's always the government always work against the people. We accept that. And you're not saying we accept it, but you know, we know that goes on. Now, if the people have this psychology of saying, you know what, we will build this by ourselves. Because a lot of us are doctors, some of us are engineers, lawyers, and some of us are intelligent people in our field. Why can't we use our intelligence to uplift our people and create these institutions? And Chinese people do them for themselves. If you notice, when I, China, Chinese, they have their own Nike. They have their own, um, anything you see in America, they have it in China. You know why? Chinese people come to America. They go to schools, they learn all this, whatever they want to learn in school institutions, they become engineers, doctors, they learn all this and take it back to China and build China. So China becomes powerful. And even when Chinese people who have never been to China in their life, let's say fifth generation, they will not say, you know what, I'm American. They will say I'm Chinese first, right? because their mentality, they've been trained and socialized to build China. So that gives China power to kind of take over the world, to go to Africa, to go to Jamaica. Now us, we don't take what we have as a people and take it back to Africa and create resources because Africa is negative to us. And Africa is not a place where, you know what, I want to be right now because I don't want to get Ebola, I don't want to get disease. And we start pinpointing all these problems, so excuses so we won't really have to, um, do for ourselves, um, and I've always said this many times, we're never, we're never gonna be a powerful people, or free people, not in Jamaica, not in Haiti, not in Barbados, not in Trinidad, until Africa is free. Because Africa is, is where wealth is, is where resources are. Haiti actually wanted to join the African Union. Yes, again, when you see African Union, those institutions are government-based. Okay, like the United Nations, <laughs> you know, United Nations in Congo, you know, I get the, they have the in Congo right now, and there's actually something going on in, uh, on social media and different, I've seen them taking the wealth of Congo. So you can't, African Union is not something that we should depend on as 
um, an institution that supports Africa. Um, those things, <laughs> it has, it has, they don't do that. Okay, we have to, as a people, we have to kind of change our the way we think about these institutions because if the institutions really was to help Africa, all these things would not happen. Slavery in Libya, where's the African Union? You know, where's the outcry? Where's the African Union doing something? Creating armies, you know, it's changing. It still goes on till today. We're speaking about it. So, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, so we have to, it, it, it starts from us. It starts from you, it starts from me. It starts from how we think about ourselves, how things about, think about um, our people, so. Okay, so recently here in Brooklyn, I'm not sure if you heard about it, there is a nail salon owner who beat a black woman with a broom and threw acetone on her. Right. I'm not sure if you heard or saw about that. Yes, incident. I've heard about that, yes. Um, so I went down to that part of Brooklyn right. because I know where that area is. Right. And we successfully got the store shut down, but they tried to reopen in the neighborhood. Right. No apology to the neighborhood. And then there were actually black people who were running to hug this nail salon owner. How does this make you feel when you see people, our people, doing things like that? Well... The old me will be very upset, but um, I'm not surprised at all. Um, so we as a people, um, example, if you want to resolve any kind of issues, and you go to a therapy, you go to whoever, the first thing they tell you to do is acknowledge you have a problem, right? That's the first step. If you have a drug problem, if you have any kind of issues, you no. Know, one of the things we do not do as a people, we don't want to acknowledge that we actually have a mental illness because of racism because of a lot of things that we've gone through, colonialism, slavery still persists in our psyche to today. Um, so we have a problem as a people, and it doesn't change until we face that problem. Um, again, these people that come into our community, the fact that, and they take our money, and people say the hood is poor, they see poor people, poverty, everywhere in the, in the, in the hood, right? But the Arabs are there. The Chinese would not be in the hood if it was poor. So there is, poverty is not in the hood, right? It's really in our mindset. Now, if it's all natural for me, I've never been in America where I wake up in the morning and I go to a neighbor in America where I see black grocery store owners, where I see black nail salons, where I see any of these things. It's not around me. So kids, I've never grown, black children, I've never grown up seeing black power. So people tend to say black power a lot, but black power is actually black wealth, black institutions. Now, these people wouldn't even feel the need to want to apologize because they know they could get away with what they're doing. They know they come in our community and take wealth. They know they come in our community and take our homes, take whatever they want, and we'll be we'll willing to give it to them, right? Um, so again, going back to what I said, our psyche needs to change as a people. Um, power based power is really based on your relationship to somebody else. So if if somebody comes in your home and feels like you know I could take your TV, and you wouldn't do anything about it, what's to stop them? They will do it. They keep doing it. So. Uh, if you stand in your ground and say, no, you have discipline, and say, this is what we're going to do, we have to think in a very collective mentality. Black people, Africans, have a very individualistic mentality, meaning I need to get my nails done. Where's the closest shop? That's the closest shop. It's a Chinese store. It doesn't matter. I'll go to that, right? Even if you have to work 10 blocks to get to an to African nail salon, right? And we make excuses. Let's say, you know what, they're bad customer service. But the Chinese person just cussed you out two days ago. It's okay, you forgive them, right? Um, it's 10 blocks too far away. Anything for us to not empower ourselves because we're not socialized to be uh, that, that people as a collective. So we need to start changing our mindset uh, for anything to change for us. Because everything would just be as rolling in circles, you know? and we're not really finding any solutions. People come to me all the time, what is the solution, what is the solution? But every day in our behavior, we're doing things that were very destructive to us without us even realizing it. You know, so, um, again, I had a conversation with a, with a friend of mine, and he's Indian, and your friend, and he said, I told him, like, and we always talk about this kind of social issues, and he told me Indian people, Jewish people, Asian people, they move in a very combative, social structure, meaning they come in the neighborhood, they have identity, that's number one. Africans do not have identity, meaning you're Asian, I'm Jamaican, I'm Nigerian, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. Like I do for myself, you do for yourself, right? Other groups don't have that problem. Chinese people are not the same, Chinese, there are different types of Chinese people, but Chinese people are Chinese, 
any way they are, right? They come, they build for themselves. You never see a black institutions in the Chinese neighborhood. You never see a black institutions in Arab neighborhood, but they come in our neighborhood, and they, you never see Arab go to a Chinese store, Chinese restaurant. It rarely ever happens. You see Arab going to Alal, the Alal restaurant. You see Chinese going to Chinese, right? They build for themselves. They put the money even in the neighborhoods. Again, we have very divisive mentality, meaning I'm, a I'm Asian. So whatever goes on with Jamaicans, I don't like them. I'm not, I'm not African. So whatever goes on with Africans, if those Africans over there, they have, that's their problem. So that kind of creates this continual, continual destructive and oppressive behavior because we tend to be like, you know, these people are coming in, but we're allowing them. We, are, we create an environment that they can come in and do whatever they want to our community. So, yeah. Okay, so obviously the solution to that would be for people to spend money with their own, buy black, support black businesses. Right, right. I mean, it's not just about spending money. Again, uh, a mentality, because those things are side effects of uh, a real issue. Uh, then we have no sense of pride in our race. We have no identity. Once you have some pride in who you are, it's natural to spend money. Um, you, I don't need to, you don't need to tell me to spend money with you if I feel like I identify myself with you and I feel and I have a sense of pride as a as an African. And I see you as an African woman um, from 80. I say, you know what? That's, that's, my, that's, my, that's my sister. You know, you don't, those economic issues and social issues are just uh, band-aids. Like, say, you have a cold and you, you're coughing, you, you have fever. Those things are just side effects. So we need to look at the core issues that we have as a people, which is um, lack of identity, self-hatred within ourselves, subconsciously or consciously. Because a lot of people do have self-hatred, but they don't, they don't think they do. They'll say, you know what? I love myself. You love yourself, but you, you want to go shopping as a form of self-love. Right, so those things are just without really understanding. You know, I'll go shop with the whatever institutions around me. Um, really understand, not really understanding what self love really means. Self love is really your love for your people, um, a sense of discipline for your race. Um, that is self love because they are a reflection of you. Uh, I see Asians are reflections of me. Jamaicans are reflections of me. Those kind of people are like any pain of any group that looks like you, it's just you be also your pain. That's a collective mindset. So economics issue is not, it's not, a, it's not the problem at all. Um, once you start loving ourselves, once you know our history, once you have pride in our race, all those things come naturally. You know, all those things come naturally. Okay, yeah. well, speaking of self-hate, I don't know if you've heard of a celebrity. Her name is Black China. Right. Recently, she went to Nigeria to promote, I think it's called White Nishes. It's like a bleaching cream. How do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not really fond of entertainers. Uh, I feel entertainers, just like polit many politicians, are used as uh, extension of um, white domination or other group dominations on African, uh, on African people. Um, the reason why that is is one: black people watch more TV than any other, any other group in the United States, so to speak. Oh, really? uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we watch more TV, and uh, a lot of also because of economic factors. I mean, a lot of uh, black men are not really unemployed. Um, you know, that, that it's a lot of these kids are not raised in two family homes. You know, and um, so they watch TV. They're raised by Black China. They're raised by Nicki Minaj. They're raised by they're raised by all these other entertainers, um, and they it shows in their behavior. It shows in their behavior. So um, Black China is just uh, she's just a reflection of a bigger problem, you know. Because even if you take out Black China, there'll be the millions of Black China waiting waiting for to replace her. You know, so um, because we don't control our own narratives, we don't control our own media, we don't control. Um, um, at the way we're supposed to look at ourselves. And that's why this social media has become, plays a big role in many of our lives because now we have a chance to change, you know, who we are and how, how the world sees us and how we see ourselves. Um, so, um, so the issue with Black China, people have been doing it um, for a long time, you know, going to Africa and selling, um, and selling this bleaching price. It's a billion dollar industry, billion dollars. And mostly Nigeria itself, Nigeria bleached bleach more than any other country on the planet, not just in Africa, on the planet, yeah. So it's a big issue, and they, that's why they, they target Nigeria. So it's a strategic move by the company to target Nigerians. Um, again, those things are just symptoms of 
what we, what we, the issues we have as a people, meaning self-hatred. Now, if I love myself as an African, nothing will, <laughs> nothing can make me bleach. You know, nothing can uh, get me to um, change my hair or you know wear weaves in my hair. It would be unnatural. It would be unnatural for me because. I I want to be myself. I'll be proud of myself. You know, I want to wear my hair the way it grows in my head. Um, so I you don't like to see women with the weaves and. You no, know, when it comes to women with the weaves, um, I I take it more. Even though you know I, I'm not for it, but I do take a more um, passive approach because again, women are bombarded just like African men, with a lot of programming. Again, they're born into this. You know, a lot of them are born into wearing weaves. They're born into, um, you know, perming their hair, you know. Again, to be aware, to be conscious, even as an African person, as a black person, it's a miracle. It's a miracle because from birth, everything on TV is telling you what you should, to take you away from who you are. Take you away from who you are as an African person and put you in the incubator of somebody else. Right. So, again, it's a process. It's a process. So um, I, I always tell I'll talk to my friends about this. You know, when it comes to women and what, you know, comes to perming and those kind of things, it's it's OK to kind of be gentle with that, because, again, to them, it's like it doesn't sound crazy to see people um, perming their hair because everybody, most people, everybody does it. Right. But um actually the sales for relaxers have gone down by 26%. Yes, yes, it's I've, been a I, natural yeah, movement. Yes, I've, I've I've heard about that. Which is which is great. Which is, you know, which something's happening. But in terms of um you know, again, relaxing the air is still norm, meaning, you know, it's in the psyche of people like it's still norm. So some some a lot of women still don't find it natural to kind of walk outside their head, outside outside to try to get a job, they feel threatened. Like, if I, if I get a job interview, will I get this job because my hair is natural, right? Maybe when I get the job, I'm gonna, you know, get it natural first, but let me let me permit for the sake of this interview. So because we don't control those kind of things, again, that's what racism really is. People think of racism as like, me not liking you. I don't wanna sit next to you because um, of your skin color. That's not racism. Racism is institutional power, meaning, I control where you work, I control where you live, you know, I control what you eat, I control what you wear. That's power. So that's what that's what kind of changes our behavior, it changes our the way we perceive each other, it it changes how we even interact on a social level with each other. Um, so yeah, I think like those those things will change as the more we start connecting to our identity as African people, the more we start loving ourselves as African people. So you know, those things are just symptoms of a, of a, of a bigger issue. And it's not going to stop. Again, it's, it's, it would be naive to say that um, all these problems were just one day to stop. It's going to be there. It's always going to be there. It's our job, all right, as African people to really start changing how we think about ourselves, to reach that thing that we think about um about it's everything, socioeconomic issues around us, to start changing those things for the sake of our, for the next generation, for our children. Now, just going back to what I said, if if I was 18 years old now, this is 2018. Now, if I was born in 2000, I have never in my life seen a positive image of African men and African women on TV. That means 18 year old child right now, I've never seen that real on TV. Maybe they have one or two specific shows, but in, in a general sense, I've never seen a, a real positive image um, of themselves. So African women that's a that run as an adult, um, I've grown to adults really not really knowing themselves. If they've not, you know, directed right by right mother or father in their lives or even educated right, you know. Um, when I say education, I don't mean like going to school, um, going to Harvard, and like, I'm talking about really just understanding who they are as an African people. So what kind of person do you think that child will be as an adult? What kind of mentality that child will have as an adult? So again, because we don't control those kind of things and we don't make effort to control it, to kind of create our own, it, um, it continues this um, cycle of sickness in our, in our communities. Yes. Okay. Well, how do you feel about interracial relationships? Because there has been 
um, a lot of men complaining that they don't feel like black women are submissive enough and they're not obedient to their husbands, so that's why they date white women. And then there are white, I mean, black women saying that they date white men because they feel like they've been abandoned by the black American man. <laughs> okay. Um, again, but my perspective, I don't personally don't believe in a relationship. I, I believe it's very destructive to our um, power as a people, to our development as a people, um, to our progress. Um, if you look at any other race, all right? Because a lot of people, when I tell people I'm not interested in, because a lot of women that come to me, most of them are white women. And I, anytime I tell them something positive about black women, I love black women, personally. If, it's not about being pro-black or being conscious or anything like that. It's just natural because, one, I'm black. So my first choice should natural, that should come natural to me would be a black woman. Um, and anytime I say something positive about a black, black woman, I say, you know, black women are intelligent. I just, I like through the field, people get turned off. Like, okay, you know, you don't want to explore. That's one of the words they'd love to use, they want to explore. But when an Arab marries an Arab, people don't feel weird about that. They don't, they don't challenge an Arab man stating that, um, okay, why are you not exploring with a black woman, with a white woman, with other groups? They have no problem with that. Why? Because they're not socialized to think like that. Chinese person marries Chinese, mostly, mostly you don't see them having a problem. And one of the things that people don't think about the economic factor of what interracial relationship does to us. One, when you marry a black woman, you build to her, when you, you kind of, your money goes towards the black community, right? Men die first, naturally, you know, unfortunately. <laughs> Men die first. When you die, your money, your, your wealth, your, whatever you have in life goes to the family of the woman. In my culture, in just common sense, when you marry somebody, you marry their family, you marry their people. You can't separate somebody and say, you know, I love you, and that's all that matters. No, marriage is also a business factor in that as well. So when you marry somebody, you marry their people. So when you marry, if I marry a white woman, I marry white people. I marry white families, you know? And again, and I can't, a white woman can never understand me the way a black woman will understand me. Um, love cannot be separated from understanding. I can't love you as a woman if I don't understand you. If a black woman marries a white man, it can sympathize with your plight as a black woman. If you have issues we just spoke about, about hair issues, you know, going, getting a job interview with your hair not being natural, and those kind of topics. A white man can say, you know, wow, like, that sucks, you know? But he can never understand you because he's not black. He's never experienced it. He's never experienced racism. He's never experienced those kind of issues that you might experience. Now, when you have children, he cannot be an adequate father to your children because he cannot even understand what it means to be even a mixed child. And Do you consider mixed children to be black? Or? No, I consider mixed children to be mixed. Um, Mixed children, um, again, they what have about, a... about, uh, like, let's say Alicia Keys, she's, you know, not too... She's a couple shades lighter than me, but right. if you look at her, people would see her as a black woman. But I mean, again, yeah, generally people would, but, you know, um, people don't think about the... don't see the, um, the social and economic implications of mixed children. One, mixed children, if you look at any country on the planet, mixed children are used as a buffer to dominate black people. Again, it's not personal philosophies. I could be mixed and say, you know what? I'm black, but that's not gonna stop me from getting a job before a black person, for being in a better position before a black person. And this is what goes on in different countries. If you look at Haiti, look at different um, Latin America, look at um, Africa, right? Look at Sudan. Mixed government dominates the black African kids. Again, it's not about power, has nothing to do with feelings. So African black people tend to really, um, put power and I put like issues going on and feelings together. It doesn't matter. I Meaning if I'm mixed and you're black and I, we, we grew up together, I like you so much, right? And I, we go for a job interview. Most likely, most likely I get a job before you. Most likely, and this is what goes on in different countries, most likely I get better positions and where to live, you know, where access to live. People treat me better than I, they would treat you and a social concept, right? It doesn't matter if I like you or not. Right? It doesn't matter if we're best friends or not. And this is what goes on with different groups too. When we marry different groups, when we marry white, when we marry Asian, the power concept, the white domination of those groups or the, the, the Asian domination does not go away. 
So meaning you can't go to an Asian community and get a job for an Asian person. If you're looking for even mixed people, mixed Asians, mixed Europeans, don't have power against the full Europeans, meaning a mixed child from a black and white person cannot get a job before a white person, right? A mixed Arab, can I go to Arab, can I go to an uh, Arabic country and be like, you know what, I'm here, you know? People will, will, will look at him like, what's, what's wrong with you? Because why do they have a sense of love for their identity, to protect their identity? So only in African communities that a mixed person can say I'm black, right? But you're black and white. But we especially never say I'm white. You never ever see that, even though they mix with black and white. They would never do that because even on a subconscious level, they have more of a respect from their white side than their black. They will fight you to just I'm white, I'm, I'm black, because, you know, I'm, I'm black to have a black mother, but you have a white father, right? Um, which creates a sense of infiltration, you know? Every, which creates a sense of, you know what? Your culture now is mine, right? Because we are the same. Now your development, your history now is mine, because we are the same. And that's why you see people like Drake, you know, people like Alicia Keys, people like even Obama, in office, you think people, if I was Obama, you think I'll get, I'll be a president? <laughs> Someone looking like me? It would never happen. So again, I always tell people, if it's not about opinion. You could look at it in every black countries, how it works. There's white people, there's mixed people, and there's African people. And the more we create mixed children, we create a group, a new group that has become a new oppressor that would dominate our African children. And that's how it works. Again, it's not about feelings or, oh, somebody's opinion. It's about something that we see every day going on in our community, going on in the black community. A lot of this, even the, the old natural hair movement, it's taken over by mixed people. You never see a real dark-skinned black African person with, with, with natural hair, kinky hair, going out black, you know, black is beautiful. Usually, what they promote is mixed children having some sense of, you know, African hair, right? That's what they promote. They always put them in the forefront of African people, right? So again, this has, this has a very socioeconomic, you know, um, issues again, I mean, for us as, as a black people around the world. So we need to wake up to that as well. Okay, so if a black man right. and a mixed woman have a child, do you consider that child to be mixed? Um, again, it, pheno, we don't think about the phenotypes of things, because phenotype meaning like how you look doesn't matter. Meaning that if I was mixed, I mean, if my uh, grandfather was, let's say, white or Arabic, right, um, I'm still, I still look black. So some, a lot of African Americans would say, you know what, you know, my great grandfather was raped or whatever the case might be, and you know, I'm mixed with something. So what does that know? Because you, you look black, you're black, right? Phenotype does play a role in how we're treated in society. Um, how, we, how we interact, you know, I, I use the example a lot, even how we move up ladder and cooperate you know, in, in life, how people treat us in society. So if a child is, is African, meaning again, in life, it, our child is raised to as a, as a factor to it. So if a child looks African um, and the child comes from a black father and a mixed, and a mixed mother, you know, and the child becomes an African. And um, people, try to, try, people try to use this example of Malcolm X. I mean, Malcolm X is not mixed. One, his mother was, was raped, right, by, uh, I don't know, a slave master, whatever the case might be, but his mother was raped. His mother, even, even in, in several of his books, even didn't identify as, you know, so-called mixed. He hated uh, the, the mixed side of her. You know, I'm not saying that people should, but that's just the case. The father was dark-skinned like I am. And Malcolm X now resembles resemble more of the mother, you know, with I think with the hair or, um, you know, whatever. But Malcolm X is a black man, right? Because why? Because because the, the fact of how he was raised, one, um, and African American people come from a line of, um, you know, ancestors that were raped. Were not they would not be considered mixed at all, because that plays the fact that now we live, right? Plays the fact that now we're treated. Plays the fact that in how we raised our and and how we develop as a race, right? So if I was raised with a black mother and a white mother, I would never fully go against, you know, people oppressing me. Like Bob Marley, people love Bob Marley so much, right? One love has never done anything for African people, right? I always tell people, show me where love for humanity have helped black people. 
No race practiced one love, except for black people. And people talk about like, all lives matter and they have all these issues with it. But we are actually the only ones that practice all lives matter. We practice all our lives matter and every group practice Arab lives matter, Chinese lives matter. You know how they practice that? They love themselves. They build for themselves. That's how you practice your own. You could say black lives matter, but if you're not practicing by loving black women, by having black children, by building black businesses, by supporting black businesses, you actually all lives matter for that person. So we, we, we love sentiments that make us feel good. Um, they're actually, put, they're actually putting things into action. So I think we need to start changing that mindset of just this feel-good mindset um, to really just, you know what? We're disciplined people. Raise your children. There's nothing wrong with raising your children to, to marry a black person. There's nothing wrong with raising your children. You know what? You must grow up to marry a black person. You must, because every group does that. You, you never see a rap, really ever see a rap, so say, you know, I'm gonna marry a white person, I'm gonna marry black. Never. And if they, they marry black, they probably just do it for sex. And say, you know what? They'll tell the black, the black girlfriend, look, I don't know my mom will feel about you, by me marrying you. You really ever see that, even Muslims, even amongst them Muslims, Arab you marries Arab because they didn't understand their economic empowerment. It's not about feelings. You never see Arab say, you know what, I feel bad, let me just love everybody. But us, it seems like society has put us in this place where if we're not giving ourselves to everybody, it's a problem. And I have conversations with friends all the time who they'll tell me, you know what, I will marry a white Chinese, it doesn't matter, who love is love. And I tell them, like, how can you say you love somebody that could never understand you as a black person? So you're gonna grow up, have children with this person, get older with this person, and this person never understand what it means to be black. And you, we say something, they, it won't really resonate with them, right? You always have to explain yourself to them. You always have to be careful, work on ice so that they don't really get their feel. You don't wanna, they don't want, you don't want to you know, say things that will feel like you're attacking them. Because if, if Chinese people are coming in, going to China, Jamaica and you marry a Chinese woman, you can't really say too much bad things about Chinese people, right? If white people are oppressing your neighbor, or creating gentrification, you have to be careful what you see around white, about white people because your wife is white. So you want to live the rest of your life like that and have children like that with this person that can never understand you and you call that love. A white person cannot love and never love a black person. It's not possible because love comes from understanding. Love comes from me, you know, I know how you feel. God forbid somebody, your friend's mother dies, right? And your friend, and you have your mom, correct? And your friend calls you and it's like, you know what? My mom just died. You be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. No matter what you do, you never understand what she feels, how she feels, unless your mom died. And that's the problem with black people feel to understand that one, just even not looking at the fact that historically they've raped and killed our ancestors, killed, have, killed our ancestors. You never see anybody challenge a Jew and be like, why are you not marrying a, a German? You never see that. So to them, it's unnatural to say, somebody raped and killed my ancestor, put my ancestors in a, in a, um, in a camp and you want them to marry them, you'll be, you'll be afraid to ever ask them that, you know? But for your own people, it's natural. Like, how dare you not? You must be racist, you know? So I feel like our problem is that we're not developing the psyche of racism within our people, because a lot of people don't say they're racist. They just practice it. Chinese people don't say they're racist. They just come in the community and take your money and marry their own and build for their own. Arabs and Indians don't say they're racist, but they just do for their own. That itself is racism. Racism is not a bad thing, it just, it's, that's what they call it, race. Racism, it's a race to power. They build for their own people, so um, we need to challenge that energy and start building for our own. And again, if we're not socialized, our parents didn't raise us, and many of us like that, so we're not socialized to think like that. You know, we're more, we're thinking of, you know what, one day we have a, this racial society where everybody's one peace and one love, and you know, you know that society might happen, and it might in the future. But black people will definitely will be extinct for that happens because that's what's happening, and we're dying as a race, as a people. Not 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 just mentally, but physically as well. You know, so um, we need to really change that. That because when you when you when you love yourself, you want to protect yourself. You want to protect your hair. You want to protect your identity. As a dark skin man, I'm more attracted to dark skin women because. 
you know, even amongst black women, I'm more attracted to dark skin women because I'm a dark skin man. So in my nature, I'm just, I love somebody to compliment me. I, I love somebody, like my kid to look like me, to be dark like me, to embody my, my features because I love myself. I want everything around me to look like me because I love myself. When you love yourself, you want to be around your people. No matter what, because Nigerians, some of them, they annoy me, <laughs> you know? They have their issues too, but I love my people, you know? Like, I don't make excuses to say, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't make excuses to say, you know what? Those people, you know, they talk too much, you know, they gossip too much, I want to be around them, I want to go away. No, it's just natural to want to be around them because, you know, I just, my people, you know, you, you want your kids to look like you. You want your kids, you want to look in the face of your kids and be like, he has my eyes, he has my cheekbones, he has my color. It's just natural. You don't have to think about it. So even the term pro-black, even it's like, why do you have to be pro-black? Why can't you just be black? Why can't you just be African? Because it's, it's a reflection of our sickness as a people. Because it's natural to say, you know what? I only want to marry a, a black person. It's natural to say mixed people are not black. It's natural because you want to protect yourself. You want to protect your culture. Mixed people can never be white. You never see a mixed person say I'm white. Because why? Because they respect that whiteness. They could challenge you because you don't respect your blackness. They would challenge any black person I'm, I'm black. Because they know majority of black people don't, re don't protect their culture. That's where a lot of hip hop now is mostly owned by white rappers when I taken over, right? Rock and roll was once, was created by black people, but it's not theirs anymore, right? You don't, want, you don't protect your identity. Now, all those things come from self-love because you want to protect yourself. A mixed Asian, can I go to, a, a, like I said before, I know, I know I'm repeating myself, but can I go to China and be like, yes, I've arrived. That mixed person will be at the last, at the bottom. When a mixed person go to Africa, go to Haiti, go to um, Jamaica and just dominate and say, you know, I get the best job like that. I get treated better like that. All these girls want me like that. All these guys want me like that. It's a reflection of self-hatred of self -hatred. because when you love yourself, you want to protect everything about you. Your history, your identity, your culture. So, yeah, so all those things are just uh, uh, a symptom. And not to say black people come in in all different shades. Like Igbo people are very majority light-skinned people. Igbo people look like you, you know, by, you know, by uh, just- Brown skin. Brown skin, right? So we, no, 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 no we, 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 come in, in, we come in different, different shades. So when people think of Africa, I, I believe like dark blackness, like black like me has to be this symbol of Africanity, mm -hmm. right? Has to be what Africa is, that's what Africa is, blackness. Um, but we do come in different shades because majority of us are black, are dark skinned people, you know. Um, but Africa, a lot of people feel like, you know, I'm light skinned, I'm African American. A lot of African Americans are mixed. Major, a lot of us, a lot of African Americans are definitely just pure African. A lot of them do ancestry DNA now, and I see them, they say, oh, I'm 100% African. Like, yeah, duh, like, you look like a lot of people in Nigeria, <laughs> you know, you look like a lot of people in Ghana. So um, it just, it more of a, you know, once you start, Socializing this sense of love for ourselves, we start instead of running away from being African, we have to run towards being African. So, everything, all those things, other things are just uh, symptoms of of our um, of our issues, of our main issue as a people. And how do you feel about many of our people who have actually never gone to Africa? Um, I don't. Again, that I I I, I take more of a passive role take because I do understand where that comes from, you know. I understand that because when they turn on TV, what the first thing they see? They don't see a good image of Africa. You know, if not for social media, when I first got to this country, people thought I'd never see a T-shirt. I wore a T-shirt one day to school and, and it had some letters or a picture on it. And everybody was like, oh, look, you have a picture with a picture. Like, like, I've never seen a, uh, I've never wore a T-shirt with a picture on it. Like, to them, Africa is so primitive that they want they don't want to go there. They want to go to a place where they'll sleep in dirt and you know can't you know take away all the luxury of being in America. They don't want to see. They want to go to the desert and sleep with lions. That's, that's their perspective, and because they've been socialized again by an institution that we do not control. And um, going back to Christianity and Voodoo, because we don't control our narrative, we don't control our school system, we don't control our curriculums. 
we, we are given to us. We don't give our children, like, this is what Africa look like. This is what Christianity is, is good. Voodoo is bad, right? If we have control of ourselves, of our institutions, of our, uh, of our education, of how we perceive ourselves, um, you know, all this, all this um, perspective, it would be natural for African Americans to want to go back to Africa and learn about different cultures, learn about their people, you know. It would be good, like, they don't, they don't, they don't see them, they don't see, they don't see themselves as being African one. Um, there is no group in the world that really suffered from identity issues like African Americans because they, they've been fed so much. They were called Negro, they were called Black, they were called African American, but the reason to it, because what you call yourself is tied to your mentality as a people. If they were called Africans, right, the reason they were called Negroes, because Negroes was tend to kind of demoralize them, right? If they were called Africans, it, empower, it empowers them. It tells them they have a home, right? They have a place that is outside of this place, America. And if they were to tell them, you know what, you are, you're you're black, you're black American, you're this, you're that, whatever the case might be, psychologically tells them that there is no other place for you to go but here. This is your home, right? And it makes sense, you know, um, because name is power. It starts with being out of my name, Olayinka. Wealth, it means wealth surrounds me. When we have children in Yoruba culture, we, we give them these names, powerful names. We take them to a spiritualist. You know, and spiritually, we kind of look at the divinity and look at their future and give them a name based on their future, right? So name comes to power. So believing that when you, when you call somebody's name, that spiritual force of that name follows the person, right? So when you call somebody Negro, call somebody African-American, that force follows them, meaning they grew up with that mentality. You know what? I'm not really African. You know, I'm here an American. You know, you never see Chinese black, I'm Chinese-American. If you look at Chinese restaurants, they write Chinese, right? Italian people, they have Italian flags. Um, Arab people, they don't, they don't, they don't, they dress as themselves. They, if you see, they have their robes on. If you go to the store, they constantly speak in Arabic, right? When you take away people's language, people's origin, give them names that is not really theirs. You take away their power. You change how they see themselves, you know, and and that's one of the, you know. Again, side effects of some of the issues that we face and take away the, 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 the love of who they are. So that's why I mean, when I came to this country, people that hated me the most were, Afri were African Americans. Like, um, I hate the word African Americans, but I'm gonna use it for the sake of, um, just for people to understand. So they, they, they didn't like me. And people that were nice to me were actually white people. White people come to me like, oh, what does this mean? What does your name mean? What does that mean? They were intrigued, you know? And African Americans were just like, I just be walking on the street, someone just punched me in the back of the head and call me African Buddhist crasher. And for a long time, I had this image of African Americans as, you know what? They're lazy, they're not smart, they have all these issues going on with them, and you know, that's why they act like that. That's why some of them act like that. But when I start thinking of the systematic, when I start, when I start growing up and start learning, educating myself and start looking at the systematic attacks constantly on these people, right? I call my people, right? <laughs> because we are African people. I start understanding where this behavior comes from, where this um, brainwashing comes from. Like one, you look like me, and I've been told that being African is ugly. So consciously, you're gonna hate me because one, because we look so much alike. Like you're black, I'm black, and being told like you come from Africa and told like Africa is ugly. And even, you know, it, a lot of times it's not conscious, but you just ate somebody because one, you want to get away from who you are. You, know, you want to get away from who you are. So you just, that hatred, and that, that, that hatred for yourself kind of projects on that person. So I think that's a lot of issues that, you know, we have as a people. So when we start loving ourselves and start, thanks to social media, a lot of African Americans are starting to see the beauty of Africa. And there's actually a, a a lot, of, a lot of them are you start to travel back to Ghana, Nigeria. Um, I always tell you, go to Nigeria, you love it. You go to Ghana, you love it. Go to, um, go to different areas. Go to Kenya, go to South Africa. Go to all these places and learn about who you are. And um, I think as time goes on, as we start controlling our narrative, which we are doing right now with a lot of social media platforms, 
um, we will just start getting that, you know, feeling to go back to our continent and build it, bring up, come up with ideas. Um, Africa is a billion dollar industry right now. It's billions of, like, when I, when, I, when I was in Nigeria, I just saw so many opportunities, wealth everywhere, but because a lot of Africans don't even see it because they're not really, um, they're not exposed where we are here in America. Like, they don't, a lot of things that we could build there is still not developed. If you want to build businesses in America, there's so many competitions. Yeah, if you want to, Uber is everywhere. Facebook, whatever, all these kind of industries are everywhere. But Africa, the Uber is not really strong there in Africa, in Nigeria. You know, they have Uber, but it's not strong there. You could create your own industry. Whatever you're doing, if you're doing music, you could build your own there. And you will make so much, you could build within, within five years, you could create an empire for yourself. So the wealth there is, is rich. Is rich for businesses, rich for ideas. Um, and that's why I always tell people to um, go back to the continent and invest, and invest, and, 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 build, for, and build for your people. Yes. Okay. Mm. And I also want to talk, because you talked about how we are portrayed in the media. I'm not sure if you know who Nicki Minaj and Cardi B are. Right. But I don't listen to today's music because I've noticed that there are so many negative things that are being said. Like, for example, these women will refer to themselves as the B word. Right. And to me, that's a derogatory word. And that used to be a word where if you referred to a woman as the B word, she would feel disrespected. But now women are referring to themselves as that. And even men are referring to women as the B word. How do you feel about today's music, today's rap? Right. <laughs> if, if you notice, uh, a lot of this, uh, everything you just said, using the B word, is really geared towards black people. If you notice, no other group really asks this issue in terms of somebody calling us a B word. And this derives directly from slavery. A B word is a bitch. A bitch, I don't know if I should have a camera, but really like, it's a dog, really. Right? So you're saying your woman is a dog. And when people call B word, they usually think about black women. Example, ebony, right? Back in the days, when you think of ebony, you're thinking beauty, you're thinking elegance, you're thinking strong, beautiful black woman. Now you Google ebony or you see porn, right? Going back to what we said, we don't control our narrative. We've been, again, when we, those people like Nicki Minaj are not targeting people like me. Because people like you and me are not, the majority, the majority of people who live in areas where they're less, they're, they're more um, susceptible to those kind of images. They're more susceptible to all this kind of programming, right? So they don't target people who understand how things work, which is not the majority. Um, so people like Nicki Minaj and Cardi B are tools of, I call it social engineering. Social engineering is basically how you conform people's attitude, people's perspective for themselves and for each other and for their community. So they, people like Cardi B, are, are, that's why you see a lot of um, black women used as a symbol of sex, right? A lot of black women who are teachers, who are intelligent women, now, because of their curves, automatically you see a woman like that, automatically you think sex. Why is that? Because all over the media, they use that as, as sex symbols, right? So when you see a, a, a black woman, the first thing you think about intelligence, you think about even black men. I can see for myself, you know, I work out, I train, I run track, I do all this kind of thing to take care of myself, you know? And people see me, they don't see intelligence. You know, I've been called Mandingo many times, you know, by black people. I've been, like, when they see a black man, you don't think, oh, he has to be something for himself. He has to be something you know, intellectual or something sense of progressive. We've been dimmed down to sex. And that's the same mentality during slavery because black men, black women were used just for that purpose, sex. And even intelligence is frowned upon, even amongst black people. If you notice in, um, in when people talk to their friends about issues concerning black people, let's talk about you know, um, racism. Let's talk about Christianity and Islam and how it's affecting us. Let's talk about voodoo. Let's talk about all this conversation we're having. People are turned off by it. Like, oh, you're doing too much. Or you're too pro-black. Pro -black. They use the words like Oteb, you too Oteb, or you too whatever. It, it makes them feel uncomfortable to talk about things that affects them every day, you know? Um, because again, we watch TV more than any other group. I suggest people stop watching TV. Just pick up a book and read, <laughs> you know? Uh, 
it's it, it, because we don't again we don't uh, uh, watch this program <laughs> watch this program and but uh, again we, when, when, when anything that we not control is always attacking us um, and it's always subtle attack and going back um, and I'm not getting away from what you said about Nicki Minaj because a lot of times those, pe those people again are tools of conditioning how we see ourselves right a black woman is not beautiful now unless she's she's half naked you know not to say she shouldn't express herself or whatever you know feel love yourself feel beautiful but how come that's like the main narrative how come that's the only narrative that we have in general right because we have these images in front of us a, a woman mostly is not they should have a lot of botox in, um, injections is gradually going up even amongst black people why because black women are feel pressured to have big butts to feel loved by black men right to be accepted by society you know, they have to have this curvy sexual look. And it comes from people like Nicki Minaj and all this Cardi B, all these people. Um, because it's again, it's a social engineering, it's a programming, and we combat these things by stop watching Nasa's programming, stop watch what your kids are watching. Right? Be careful what your kids are watching. Take away the 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 the, the laptops from your children. Decide what to watch. We have to be more of a disciplined people. You know, because a lot of kids are suffering. 20-year-old kids are having sex, doing like 19, 14, 13. They just having children, having babies. And again, it comes from those kind of people, like Mickey Minaj and Cardi B, and those kind of, you know, training our kids, because we don't, we're not raising our kids. And a lot of times we see these little kids emulating these people, we think it's fun, we think it's funny. Or like, look, they're always doing a little twerking dance, a little dancing, everything is nice. But it's doing so much damage um, um, to our people. So we need to take control of our narrative, we need to take control of our, um, of how we see ourselves and how, um, and how we interact with each other. One, by stop worshiping the celebrities. Um, and two, by doing things that creating new narratives for ourselves and say, you know what, black men are, uh, are not just beautiful but intelligent. Blackness is, is, is equates to being, you know, powerful, resilient, right? And not just sex symbols. Not just say, you know what, because she's tall and big, and that means she has to be good in bed. Because she's curvy, that means she has to be some kind of like, you know, um, trophy wife. Not to say she can't she can't build empires. Not to say she can't she can't be a good accountant. Not to say she can't be a good teacher. So we need to start changing those things ourselves. You know, yeah. All right. So is there anything else that you would like us to know? Yes. Um, basically, you know, I would like for us as a people to start seeing each other as one people. Um, when when I say one love, I would like that guy to actually be for African people. African people must start. Um, feeling themselves, um, sharing each other's struggles, understanding that, you know what? Your struggle is my struggle. As a Nigerian, your pain is my pain. Um, as a Jamaican, as an African and American, um, we are one people and we need to start caring for each other, building up each other, creating positive empowerment for each other. Um, if you wanna love, um, if you wanna create positive environment, I suggest you do it for your own people first. So I think uh, that would be a good start <laughs> for for all of us as a people. And with that, over time, you know, we start creating beautiful nations, creating kids, creating children that will grow up to be strong leaders. Um, a lot of us want to be, you know what? We want somebody to stand up for us and speak and be, you know, guide us to the right path, but we're not creating environments for that to happen. You know, we don't control our curriculums. We're not creating, we're not making people comfortable to speak about social issues. So we need to start doing that for ourselves so we could train our kids to build up, could come up and become strong leaders. So it starts with us, it starts with you, it starts with me, it starts with everybody watching um, at this time, so. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Now tell us how we can get in contact with you and how people can keep in touch with you after this interview. Yes. Um, follow my social media page, Omo Yoruba 73. So I'm going to spell it because it's kind of long. It's O M O Y O R U B A 7 in 3. So follow my social media page. Um, also follow my personal page. Um, that social media page is more of information. Um, also follow my personal page, Yinka73, Y-I-N-K-A-7-3. Um, so um, I give 
bold information about just not just Africa, but a lot of things going on around the world, and um, how we can go about solving our solution, uh, solving our problems as a, as a people. So follow both of my pages and um, feel free to DM me. Um, and yeah, <laughs> so thanks a lot for inviting me. I really appreciate All right, this. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Now, guys, if you want to keep in contact with us, make sure that you subscribe to Trading Photos at youtube.com slash trading photos. And you can also follow my personal YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Queen Bianca Brooks.